and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us. Darren, we got bugs all over the place. It's hot. It's a super windy day. We're tucked in kind of behind some trees here. And you know, it seems to me like we're just about at the right time for spider mites. So that's why we want you to start scouting your fields. We're gonna talk about how to do that today and how you can control spider mites on your farm. Well, that's certainly important, but it's also important to take a look in your corn crop and just learn things from this year. And we're gonna talk about some of the lessons we've learned from 2013 that could impact how we do things going forward. We've got a Weed of the Week coming up later in the show too. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. In our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about the value of wheat stover. As this year's wheat crop comes off, you may be tempted to bale up the stover and sell it to somebody else or use it with livestock in your operation. We're going to talk about how much that stover is really worth before you make those decisions. Well, if you're a non-farmer too, we just want you to understand that it's not just the grain out in a field that has value, it's also the straw, the stalks that are left, those types of things, they have value. So just last winter, I put something together for our Ag PhD winter workshops, and I just pulled the sheet out today, and we were talking about this wheat stover thing, and I said, you know, that wheat stover is worth a lot of money based on relatively current values for nutrients, so like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, micronutrients. We figure that roughly one ton of dry matter, so that's in other words, a ton that's dried completely down, so 0% moisture. So that's not a ton of actual straw because that's gonna have some moisture in it. But still, a ton of dry matter is roughly worth just shy of $40. $40 for a ton. And when I look at how much a farmer is getting in many cases for this wheat straw, it's not $40 per ton of dry matter. So in some cases, if you're not paying attention, you might be selling something as a farmer that is gonna cost you more just to replace the nutrients. And this is just nutrient value alone. This isn't even figuring value of organic matter. Well, there's a couple of things at play here. You know, first of all, anytime we're looking at something coming out of the field, we like to look at nutrient removal. How many nutrients are in there? We for sure have to put at least that many nutrients back. It's like when we harvested the wheat off, if we took 100 bushels of wheat off, we figure out exactly how many pounds of nutrients were in that 100 bushels of wheat and make sure we put at least that much back in the field because we want next year the soil to be at least as valuable and as productive as it was this year, if not even more so. Now, the other thing, Brian, that oh, I Oh, wait kinda... a second. Before you get to that, Darren, I was just going to say we do have, if you have a smartphone or let's say an iPad, we do have a free app that you can download. It's called the Fertilizer Removal App from Ag PhD, and you can look up exactly what wheat nutritional values it's going to have per bushel and also per ton in terms of stover. Okay, the other thing I was going to add there too, Brian, is if you're taking that stover off with the full intention of bringing it back. Now, now let's say you run it through an animal and then you bring all the manure back in the field, that's just fine. Or like when we were kids growing up, we would bale up the wheat straw in small square bales and we'd bale up oat straw just the same. We would use that for bedding in our hog pens. The hogs would of course make a big mess out of it and there'd be manure in there and everything else. And then we'd spread that back out in our field. Now in that case, dad wasn't worried about how many nutrients came off the field because he knew he was going to put all that back and more so when he spread that manure back in the field. So if that's your plan for your operation, you're in good shape. But just keep in mind, if you're bringing that stover off, there is a value there that we're talking about just in nutrients, but also in organic matter. And you have to make sure you're at least replacing that in your field. Yeah, so we've talked a little about the nutrient value. That organic matter is worth something too, though. So in other words, if you don't have as much organic material, that, that straw, that residue on top of the ground, some of that will eventually decay and become organic matter below ground. And the more organic matter you have, the more kind of sponge effect your soil has. So it can hold more water and nutrients. It can absorb more compaction and spring back. It just does so much for your soil overall, helping to entertain more soil life. There are so many things, I can't even list them all here. All I'm trying to say is you've got nutrient value, you also have organic matter value. So if I'm getting anything less than at least 50 or $60 a ton, per ton of dry matter, there's no way I'm letting that wheat stover go. In fact, we haven't let any of our wheat stover go. We've just left it right in the field, chopped it up, and said, hey, it's just worth too much. I want to keep it in my field. The other thing I think about is whether you're going to take that stover off or leave it out in the field. One of the considerations is if you're taking it away, now you probably don't need to do any tillage. And I would advise doing little to no tillage out there, leaving those root systems intact. When it comes to the impact on organic matter, if you at least leave the root system intact, a rule 
rule of thumb is you have about as much plant matter below the ground as you do above. So you've at least left half the plant matter out in your field and that's the part that's going to do the most for you in helping building organic matter. So if you're taking some stover off, please don't do much tillage out there, if any, to try to maintain your organic matter levels. Well, once again, we just wanted you to understand that wheat stover or any stover has a fair amount of value and please figure that out each year and you can run some numbers yourself. There are many universities that have nice little calculators online for you based on today's nutrient value, whatever year it happens to be and whatever nutrient value are in your particular area. We just want you to understand what your costs are before you sell off your stover for too little money. Well, one important thing to recognize your costs on is weed control. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. Your equipment's ready. The seed's in the barn. You have a strategy to overcome the challenges you'll face and your crop protection products are pretty well locked in. But maybe you still haven't finalized your fertilizer plans. If not, visit agroliquid.com today. With products formulated for superior nutrient uptake, unsurpassed application flexibility, and proven by years of extensive research, this may be the season to take your yields to the next level using agriculture liquid fertilizer. Upgrade your trailer to electric with the Rolltech electric system from AgriCover. Strong, flexible pivot arms and motor mount rotate and telescope, allowing the roll tube to rise and flex over heaped loads. The positive automatic lock is impossible to back off to control the flow of grain. This integrated system uses one wireless remote to operate up to 10 tarps and hoppers, keeping your driver out of the dust, rain, and harm's way. See the Rolltech system in action at an AgriCover dealer near you. Wake up. Breakfast is served. Your roots crave pea. Most of your applied pea gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with a Veil Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. A Veil makes more pea available to your roots. Here, here, and here. Increasing pea availability can lead to increased pea uptake in the plant. That's more pea, more pea, and more pea. More phosphorus for your crop can mean more results in your bin. An average of 9.9 .9 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pea with a Veil. At Titan Machinery and Case IH, we offer better solutions for all your production needs. It's more than our job, it's who we are. We are parts. We are service. We are training. And most importantly, we are here for you. In any season, for every reason, we've got you covered. Case IH and Titan Machinery, better solutions. What's new for 2013? Challenge 2050. Challenge 2050 is a two-component system consisting of a nutrient and a biological additive. This groundbreaking fertilizer contains mycorrhizal fungi, which provide an extended transport system that allows water and nutrients to be delivered directly into the root. Challenge 2050 can increase yield and efficiency of your standard fertilizer program. Challenge 2050 is the future of fertilizer. Call TJ Technologies or your fertilizer dealer and get Challenge 2050 today. Spider mites. Darren, I can't stand spider mites. Here's the biggest problem I've got. Nobody has an exact threshold out there. You look at any university, any agronomist, they have no exact number. Of course, even if they did have an exact number, how are you going to count those tiny little mites? Well, and the other thing that comes into play is when do we normally have spider mite problems? It's when it's hot and dry and yep. the crop is stressed. Right. And now you say, well, maybe my crop could tolerate more spider mites, but I'm under so much stress right now, it really can't tolerate any insects or at all. the other way is you say, well, it's hot and dry. I've got drought type conditions. I don't want to invest any more dollars into my crop. And then it really goes downhill. So we're standing in a soybean crop here and we were talking a little before the show we walk out here it's and Darren starting goes, to suffer a little yep, bit yep Darren says this this crop's suffering we need rain and and I said nah soybeans love this kind of weather they like it hot and dry fairly early on once you start getting into August though then we do need some moisture so once we hit the first of August we got to start getting some moisture and then we're typically going to have good beans but keep in mind soybeans like lots of sunlight and soybeans are a much different crop than corn so even in this bad drought year of 2012 just a year ago we had all kinds of great soybean yields out there because people started getting moisture at the end of the season and crops they thought were lost came back and all of a sudden yield did pretty well. So what I'm trying to say is don't give up on your crop. It's inexpensive to treat for spider mites. 
consider treating if you see a lot of them. Here's one of the things that's going on right now in soybeans in our area. Farmers are finding soybean aphids and they're going out to spray soybean aphids and they're thinking about cost and saying, well, what's the cheapest thing I can use yep. that'll kill soybean aphids? Well, there are some really cheap pyrethroids that may only cost two or three dollars an acre. And a lot of guys are just saying, yep, let's do that. Let's not spend any more money. We're getting late in the season. But what they're forgetting to do is scout for spider mites because a lot of those cheaper pyrethroids may do a nice job on soybean aphids, but they don't get spider spider mites. And once we wipe out all the other bugs in the field and leave spider mites alone, the spider mite numbers often explode. Okay, so let's be real specific here. When we're talking about products like Silencer and Declare, they are very inexpensive, just over two bucks an acre for the full rate. And you'll wipe out your aphids and just about any other bug except for spider mites. If you have spider mites, that's where you would want to go with something like Capture or the generic is called Fanfare. Or you could go with Lore's Ban or the generic there would be called Pilot or, you know, there are many other generics too. So it's that Capture family, that Lorsban family, those are the ones that actually have spider mite activity. All those other pyrethroids, whether it's Silencer, Declare, Warrior, Asana, I mean a whole host of them, they're not going to stop the spider mites. Now as far as scouting for spider mites, they are really, really tiny little bugs and finding the first few spider mites that are in a field is pretty tough. Normally the numbers explode a little bit and you start seeing a little bit of webbing often on the undersides of leaves, right along the midrib on corn leaves for example, and that's where you start noticing some Something. or on soybeans, maybe you see a little discoloration on the leaf and you see some tiny little speckling on the leaf. That's how I, a lot of times, will see, oh my goodness, we've got spider mites out there. But before you're spraying any insecticide in your field, you absolutely have to scout, look for those symptoms, talk to other growers in your area. If you hear somebody else is starting to get spider mites, chances are you are as well. Okay, so in terms of threshold, we don't have any real great numbers for you. I wish that we did. When we start seeing a lot of plants that have spider mites on them, we're typically treating on our farm. Uh, there are some people that will say, well, you don't want spider mites getting to your ear leaf on corn. There are some people who will say, well, when you see them on several leaves on a soybean plant, that's the time you want to do something. I just say, look, we probably have other bugs out there anyway. We're probably going out to treat anyway. If you see any spider mites out there or even think you're going to get spider mites, I would upgrade your cheap pyrethroid up to a fanfare or a Lorsban product. It'll probably cost you an extra two bucks an acre. It's not very much money, but then at least you've got spider mite protection. And fortunately for this year, a lot of growers remember 2012, where we were really dry across most of the country and spider mites are probably the worst that I've seen in the last 20 years. And so many farmers remember, oh, yeah, last year I had to do something when it got hot and dry. So this year already farmers are asking questions like, you know, it's kind of getting hot and dry again. I remember last year we had to change insecticides and so it is top of mind for many growers that had a spider mite issue last year. But make sure that you aren't just looking at the lowest dollar. Make sure you're looking at the best return for your farm and make sure that you're killing all the harmful bugs in your fields when you're making an extra pass. Let me just say too, the reason why we have spider mites when it's hot and dry is because typically there is a fungal pathogen that is going to attack spider mites and kill them when it's cooler and wetter. So if we all of a sudden turn around in your area Area, let's say, to cool and wet conditions for a while, your odds that you're going to have a spider mite problem dramatically go down. If it stays hot and dry in your area for quite some time, you know chances are you're going to see spider mites again this year. Well, there are a lot of things going on in cornfields too that we're going to talk about in a little bit. One of those things may be our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? Hey everybody, I'm Steve Azar, singer-songwriter. Really happy that Brad Swenson and Swenson Investments asked me to write the song American Farmer. The American Farmer. I've had the pleasure of getting to know the fine folks at Swenson. And I gotta ask you, do you know what happened to your farm if something happened to you? Swenson's works with farmers, lawyers, and their advisors to put together the best estate plan. Hey, you work hard for your farm. They work hard to help you keep it.
Well, after sweating through about two shirts out in the field, we decided to change clothes and head inside. Where we're at now is our radio studio. Darren and I have been doing a radio show lately called Ag PhD Radio on Sirius XM. So here we are in the studio. Nothing terribly fancy, but I like the sound and I like the temperature. Well, the temperature <laughs> is quite different. As you notice, I had to put a coat on when he came into the meat locker here of our, our radio studio. As Brian is mentioning, our radio show is actually on the new rural radio channel on Sirius XM. That's channel. 80, where there's farm and rural lifestyle programming all day. It's something new, and listeners are really excited when they find that station. That's yeah, the first ag station on Sirius XM. So we're on there every afternoon. We do an hour-long live call-in show. So like Ag PhD TV, you can certainly email us questions and, and give us a call or something like that. But during our radio show, you actually get to interact with us live, and that's pretty fun for us. Yeah, so that's 2 p.m. Central weekdays. Darren and I are doing this live every single day. So we invite you to give us a call or send us an email. Well, one of the questions we've been getting a lot lately from farmers is, what lessons did you learn in 2013 about corn that can help us going forward to 2014? So where I've been starting with everybody is on the fertility side. We saw more yellow corn. I mean, I was literally sick to my stomach when I was driving around in early June this year because all the cornfields I thought just looked absolutely horrible. Even where we'd put on a lot of fertility, a lot of guys were trying to do what they could with fertility, but we really saw that placement was important, making sure you had ample fertility, and then also in terms of stabilizing nitrogen or keeping phosphorus available with things like Avail, all those things really showed up this year. Well, we saw them early in the season. We saw deficiency symptoms showing up in fields. We also are seeing them later on. Like, for example, with the nitrogen, a lot of that nitrogen was lost. And, you know, depending on when it was put on, how it was put on, and so forth, as Brian mentioned, if we've already lost some of that nitrogen and now we get decent growing conditions and we get a crop that could have really produced, that's where you're going to see it showing up on the lower leaves of the plant. You're going to get nitrogen firing from the tips of the leaves moving down the midrib. Now, once you see that firing on leaves and all these symptoms this late in the season, there is just nothing you can do to save the yield that you've already lost. However, this goes into your planning for next year, which, you know, for us on our farm, that starts right away. We're buying fertilizer normally this time of year. And so we've already got to start thinking, all right, we need to put a little more on or we need to do it just a little bit differently. One of the issues and one of the reasons why we saw more fertility issues this year, in my opinion, uh, you know, certainly the weather had an awful lot to do with it. But the other thing is all these seed companies are telling you and telling me as farmers, we need to raise higher plant populations. So guys are bumping it. Even on our farm, our average plant population this year was probably 34, 35,000 as opposed to 30,000 just last year. So if you're going to bump that much, you're going to bump up 15, 20% more plants and you say, well, my yield goal really isn't a lot higher. Uh, yeah, that may be, but now if you've got 15 to 20 percent more plants out there, now you have to spread those nutrients over a lot more plants, and that's just not going to work in some cases. So take, for example, lodging issues. We saw a lot of lodging problems this year, and I think a lot of that has to do with the higher populations, because when we have higher populations, the plants are going to grow taller because of competition. And then the other thing is, if you didn't fertilize properly, if you don't have enough potassium there to make those stalks thick, they're going to fall down. So I think this was going to happen. It was bound to happen. It's one of the reasons why for the last probably six, seven, eight years, we've been bumping up potassium and phosphorus as much as we have in our farm, preparing for when we wanted to go with higher populations now. So once we get later on in the season and see how yields turn out, then we can talk more about how did fungicides work? How did some of the soil insecticides work and things like that? But for now, at least, we know that fertility had a huge impact on this year's crop. Obviously, drainage was one of the things. So even though a lot of guys were coming out of a drought year, we ended up with floods. It doesn't happen very often, but it did this year. So drainage really paid. And then, of course, planning ahead and getting products early. That was very important in 2013. Well, one of the things you always need to plan ahead for is our Weed of the Week. We'll show you what it is coming up next. The Weed of the Week is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. You work to protect your farm's legacy and to keep it going. Introducing the Enlist Weed Control System, an advanced herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate for exceptional control of tough weeds. The next chapter begins.
Our weed of the week is red root pigweed. Now this weed is a little bit different. Darren and I were debating off camera a little bit. Darren said, well, why is red root pigweed not becoming resistant to Roundup when the other pigweeds like Palmer and water hemp are? And I said, Darren, who cares? The point is, we've got resistance issues with water hemp, we have resistance issues with Palmer pigweed. Let's just be thankful that we can still control red root pigweed, today anyway, with Roundup. Maybe next year we'll start to see some resistance there too. So I'm not too worried about that side of things. All I know is that red root pigweed is a hairy pigweed. It's something that we see on most farms around the country and we still have a lot of good options for control in many different crops, both pre-emerge and post. Well, this is one of those weeds that for my kids when I'm showing them how to identify weeds. You know, they just like going out, pulling weeds up and taking a look at them, trying to figure things out. And when you have that well, Darren, pinkish if you didn't red... Have so, if you didn't have so many weeds, oh, then uh, they wouldn't now. have this fun. Come on now. You have this pinkish <laughs> red root, and so that's pretty easy for them to understand. Oh, okay, I understand why. But, you know, with red root pigweed, it's very similar in control to the other pigweed species weeds other than that Roundup still gets it. We need to start with a pre-emerge herbicide program in any crop. And let's start with soybeans. For soybeans and pigweed control, we like the three pre-emerge herbicide approach. So we'd start with one of the yellows like Treflan, Sonlan, or Prowl. Then we'd put one of the PPOs in like Authority or Valor. And then we'd follow up by also putting in some Metribuzin. So we get, again, three different sites of action that all work on pigweeds. Okay, so fortunately post-emerge, Roundup still works. Liberty still works. There aren't a lot of great options in soybeans post-emerge. Flexstar would probably be the best. Now, really late in the season, you'd most likely have to go to Cobra if you don't want to worry about the carryover risk that Flexstar has. One of the cool things, though, about red root pigweed is something Brian touched on earlier. It actually is a very hairy plant, so we can stick more herbicide on easier than we could on a water hemp or a palmer pigweed where they have smoothly. All right, so real quick, corn pre-emerge, what would you do? Well, I like Verdict a lot. I also like Sure Start and Triple Flex. They do a pretty nice job. Balance Balance anything, flex might be the best, though. Anything with balance flex in it, though, is very good on the pigweed species. Okay, post-emerge corn. I like status, but you could also use Callisto Lotus Impact. They do a decent job. All right, pre-emerge wheat. I like sharpen the best, and then post-emerge, I would use husky, but I'd have to bump that rate up just a little bit, so I'd probably go with a high-end rate on husky. Well, once again, our weed of the week is red root pigweed. Fortunately, it's not resistant to Roundup yet, but who knows what the future holds. Well, that's it for our weed, but stay tuned. Iron Talk is coming up next. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. What are farmers doing to feed the planet? They're using Quadtrek technology, soil management, and planting systems from Case IH to foster a better growing environment that maximizes yield potential. Visit CaseIH.com to be ready. When seeding cover crops, how do you get a blend to spread seed evenly across the field? We'll tackle that in today's Iron Talk. When we seed a cover crop, we use a blend and put it in the drill and hope for the best. To be fair, we aren't doing a huge amount of acres. Plus, since we aren't harvesting a cover crop, we aren't super worried about having an ideal mix all through the field. Here are the drawbacks to doing things this way. Number one, you planted a blend for a reason and the benefits aren't equally distributed in the field. Number two, uneven growth this year could lead to uneven growth of your crop next year. And number three, uneven growth leads to uneven residue distribution. However, the benefit of doing it how we do is that it's inexpensive and easy for us to accomplish. The guys who are doing big acres of cover crops and seeing the best responses, though, are using air carts and air drills to seed the crop the right way. With three compartment carts, they can get a very accurate spread of three different cover crops with dramatically different seed sizes. If you have the equipment to accomplish this, there's no question that's the ideal way to seed a cover crop. If not, and you're only doing a few acres, you can either seed each crop in the blend separately or just accept a less than perfect spread, seeding a blend at one time. We've chosen the latter route for now, and that's worked out fine for us so far. That's it for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. For years, farm logic has been the easiest and most convenient way to keep up with your farming operations. Well, it just got better. Introducing FarmPad for your phone. You always have your phone with you, so entering records as they happen is as easy as a touch of a button. Chemical database, GPS, service records, and more. When you do it on the farm, save it on your phone and it's backed up forever. Call or visit farmlogic.com for a free trial and find out why FarmLogic is the best decision tool for the farm. Capella corn headers are designed for producers who expect more. 
Expect more grain in your bin. Expect an industry-leading two-year manufacturer's warranty. Expect Capella design chopping and folding options that save you time and money. And whether red, green, or yellow, expect row size options that fit your operation because all producers deserve the best. Expect Capello. It's a head above the rest. You expect a lot from this seed. And as it grows through each stage of development, Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers is there, feeding your crop exactly what it needs when it needs it. So no matter how you fertilize, no matter when, Agro Liquid efficiently brings all the nutrients your crop needs for a great harvest. From one kernel in the ground to 600 on the ear. For better yields and better quality, Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers. There are more mounds to feed than ever before. What are farmers doing to meet the challenge? They're using agronomically designed equipment from Case IH. Our Quattrec technology, soil management, and planting systems are designed to foster a better growing environment that helps farmers maximize yield potential. And our deep understanding of agriculture is preparing them for the challenges ahead. Will you be ready? I'm ready. Go to CaseIH.com to learn more. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The all-new s -Cube commercial tender is the only tender on the market with poly tanks, giving you the capability to haul seed, fertilizer, water, or liquid fertilizer. Each cube can hold 300 units of seed, 2,000 gallons of liquid, or 300 cubic feet of fertilizer. Options include full-functioning wireless remote, stainless steel conveyors, and self-contained hydraulics. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. Well, thanks for tuning in today. Hopefully, Darren will be back out in the field again next time, and we hope you join us again next time as we have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. No one cares more for the environment than family farmers who plan to pass their land down to their children. These same farmers are working to double yields over the next 15 to 20 years to feed the growing world. To learn how they plan to do it, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.